Welcome to the Conversation Lab. I'm Don Schaefer. If democracy begins in conversation, then we need to nurture a culture where ordinary people like us routinely talk about those things that help us understand each other, whether it's about climate, race, religion, gender, or politics. When we're trying to make sense of our city and the world we live in, every question comes with a set of assumptions about the nature of ourselves and our place in a larger world. The Conversation Lab provides a safe place to talk about some of those things. This program is produced by CFRO-FM in Vancouver. It's available on air and online on various platforms, and we appreciate the help of Vancouver's community groups. Welcome to another episode of the Conversation Lab. My name is Don Schaefer, and today our guests are Mark serper Francoeur and Robinder Uppel. They're both documentarians who I was introduced to by the folks at Story Money Impact. Not wanting this to be a spoiler alert, but uh, much of this conversation is about their latest documentary, No Visible Trauma, which began a shorter documentary that aired on CBC called Above the Law, where they look at three different cases of police abuse in Calgary that touches on anti-black racism, wellness checks, and the unnecessary use of force. So kind of like the first day of class again, do you guys mind uh, introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about what you do? Um, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Mark Superfrancoeur. I'm a co-founder of Lost Time Media with my friend Rabindra Ruppel. Uh, we've been friends since we were little kids growing up in Calgary, and uh, we've been making docs full-time through our uh, little production company, uh, Lost Time Media, since 2013, uh, right after we finished uh we did a basically kind of a joint MFA at Ryerson and documentary media prior to that. And uh, yeah, I mean, our passion is documentary. We, uh, broadly speaking, focus on um, sort of social issue docs, but also have done a number of more portraiture ch- style pieces, uh, oftentimes about interesting old, older ladies in different parts of the world. I often say that in a, in a perfect world, we could just make, you know, uh, I think uh, touching films about amazing older women, but we seem to uh, feel Feel compelled to be dealing with some more serious subject matter, uh, in this case, uh, police brutality and accountability. Uh, my name is Rubin the Ripple. I'm also a documentary filmmaker, and like, said, like Mark said, uh, co founder of Lost Time Media. And uh, Mark and I actually we were both re- born and raised in Calgary, which is important for uh, people to know why we uh, made a film about the Calgary Police Service. That's a big part of it. But we've also lived in British Columbia and Vancouver. We are both uh, grads of the interdisciplinary studies program at the University of British Columbia and also uh, the screenwriting program that's at Langara College and the, uh, some of our background before we got into fully into documentary film, which was something we were sort of dabbling in in those years. When you say you're your old friends, were you like high school buddies? Were you in grade school together? Great, great grade four <laughs> was when we, we first met. Um, but I would say, you know, we I think that we specifically in high school and onwards, I think we kind of had a, our political awakening, so to speak, kind of coincided. And I think, um, you know, moving into university, we really uh, just uh, increasingly had a lot uh, in common and a similar sort of interest in terms of uh, engaging with the world and you know, we had um, different, I think, skills. I mean, Rabinder always was running around with the camera in his hand. I was more inclined to the writing side of things. But uh, I think in high school, I mean, Canadians, most anyone interested in doc will remember the uh, seminal uh, Canadian documentary, uh, The Corporation, which we saw at the now defunct Uptown Theatre in in Calgary during high school. And I think that was a a film that in particular for us really left a mark and let us uh, left us thinking, hmm, maybe this is the the type of uh, art form, you know, uh, occupation that could both um, bring together our our artistic inclinations and our uh, analytical ones as well. It all kind of came to a head, so to speak, when we were, we, we actually ended up traveling together in India for about seven months. And while we were there, we were filming uh, various things, but especially uh, my parents are from Punjab and we spent some weeks there. And, you know, it, this is a very complicated place and a place that's currently and has been for some years seeing a variety of ecological crises. So we started filming, talking about, you know, the, de- the decrease in water tables, the increasing use of pesticides, crop failures, all these kinds of issues and talked to a young farmer. And then we'd been back for a few years and we're in Vancouver in the middle of this Langara screenwriting program. And we decided to start making a uh, short documentary about that. And that was kind of the first documentary we, we put out into the world. And, it, you know, 
know, we've been we've been doing them uh, ever since more and more uh, as our profession uh, since 2013, like Mark said. A somewhat amusing anecdote, you know, we probably have UBC to thank, especially in the sense that, uh, you know, Rabinder and I had a deal when we were still in Calgary where he had applied already at once or maybe twice for the film production program at UBC. And our deal was that if he didn't get in, am I getting it right a third time, then we would say the hell with it and go to India for uh, instead of uh, doing another year of school. So I think that uh, in a roundabout way, that really actually served us well. So that was a gift. That's right. Rejection can be a gift sometimes. It's yeah. very true. So I'm curious if having a deep friendship has an impact on your relationship in the way you work together. Definitely. Uh, I think the the fact that we have this bedrock of, of all these years of conversations and shared history and essentially we're each other's family as well to rely on when we're getting into these difficult conversations, arguments, you know, we know we're there for each other and that whatever the, the heated debate of the day is, that the whole the whole package isn't on the line and that we are able to critique without as much emotion as sometimes enters the room. I, and I think that's really important. I, we challenge each other to really try to produce the best work that we can. And I think that constant challenge of someone you really trust and that their, their heart is in the right place when they're making that challenge to a choice that you've made in the editing room or, or wherever. I think that's really crucial to our, our working relationship and just our relationship in general over the years is, is, is having that extra set of eyes, having that second brain that you really trust to help you make the best thing that you can. Yeah, what a great compliment to both of you. Thank you. It, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I think that, uh, you know, we really do benefit from the collaboration where we're able to kind of, you know, specialize a little bit as needed, rely on each other, not have to be doing double duty all the time, pick up the slack when you know, the other guy's got something else going on. And yeah, and that that uh, that ability to really, I think, uh, engage critically without uh, fear of sort of hard feelings. Over time, you know, it's funny, we have our own internal Lost Time Media uh, style guide, for example, where we map out arguments that we've had over time about particular usage of punctuation, such that we don't have to keep having the arguments over and over once we've settled on something. So where did the idea for Lost Time Media come from? What was the epiphany? So we went and uh, did the documentary media masters, the, the MFA at Ryerson. Yeah. And this was, you know, Mark was living in Nicaragua at the time. And we decided to go for it and kind of professionalize. And, you know, it's hard to make films on your own in a, in a vacuum. And so we decided we wanted to do this thing. And we both applied and got in. And we were the first and maybe only uh, people to do a joint thesis project. We had to make an argument that this is how we worked, that mm -hmm. we were going to do this together, and that we would do twice the work, but that it would be together. And over that process, making uh, the film and the initial interactive of the world in 10 blocks, it became clear that we should be uh, towards the end of that, that we should have our own company or, or you know, an entity that we could both call our own. And, and that's sort of the, the birth of Lost Time Media was the end of the, our, our MFAs at Ryerson. And actually, I think, and I'm, I know that we we first created, and now it's we're a corporation, but at the time it was a general partnership. And I believe we actually founded it while we were still in school, from what I recall. I mean, I think it was basically sort of a foregone conclusion that we would have a company together, you know, so I think it came fairly naturally. Doesn't mean, uh, you know, it doesn't mean the company's uh, raking in all sorts of uh, great profits or anything like that, you know, but it's an entity that exists and it makes things. And you have a lot to show for what you've done. The world in 10 blocks, uh, the head in hand, haven above the law, which was the short version of No Visible Trauma, which I watched last night. And I have to tell you, it just it just blew me away. It's very, uh, it's very kind of you to say. And yeah, well, it's not a, it's not a, an entertainment, that's for sure. But uh, hopefully the impact that you felt, uh, you know, that's the goal is to make people feel something and uh, and realize that, you know, we got a problem here. And I'm still unsettled from watching it, which is, I think, a good thing. Can you talk about the social justice focus? I think Mark, you know, mentioned the the corporation as a, something that was a, a big inspiration for us. And I, I guess we both see documentary as a way of actually having some impact on on the way people think, on ideas, on actually maybe moving the needle on some of these issues that we are making the films about. It's hard to do. It, you know, I think anyone who's done something creative and tried to make an impact on the world knows that it's, it's a difficult and challenging thing. But certainly, I think we feel that, or I feel that films have had an impact on me in the way that I think and, and have added something to my life and maybe changed the way I understood an issue. And our hope is that in, in whatever small way, we can also 
find those issues and the things that we do care about and, and actually help move them along in, in a positive direction. I think to have some meaningful impact, specifically when you're talking about no visible trauma and, and above the law, um, we think these are really issues that can and should move. We should not accept the status quo here uh, as Canadians. And, and that's, this is an, an attempt to, I think, move that, move that issue in some ways. This radio program and podcast is being recorded in the Conversation Lab for CFRO-FM or Co-op Radio in Vancouver. Our guests today are Mark serpa Francoeur and Robinda Apol. Both documentary filmmakers, and today we're talking about No Visible Trauma, which looks at three recent cases of police abuse in Calgary. So I'm curious how it all comes together. Uh, in the production of a documentary, from the idea to how you get everything and all the parts collected and, and can present your work to the world. You know, it's interesting. I think that there's nothing like um, empathizing with somebody else's pain and suffering and uh, and the injustice they they've experienced to motivate you to uh, you know to do something. I think you know with this particular film, uh, we did not set out. Uh, it wasn't like we woke up one day and we're like, oh, we want to make a film about the Calgary Police Service writ large. In fact, you know we had. No, I, I don't think a lot of people back in 2015 when this project started uh, had any sense that, you know, Calgary Police Service was uh, uh, really struggling uh, in particular in a number of respects. Uh, it all really started for us when we met uh, Godfrey and we were introduced to him by his former uh, defense attorney, uh, John Bloomer, who we see in the film, who defended him uh, successfully against the charge of assaulting an officer. And uh, I think that, you know, there is something very insidious about injustice, and it gets under your skin. And I think his case alone really kind of became, uh, you know, uh, compelled us to to take that, uh, to move forward. And, and, and it took us some time to figure out, you know, what the form would be. We were originally uh, started the project. It was intended to be, we've done some interactive web documentaries as well. So the original iteration uh, was really intended to be, there would have been video elements, but intended to be a, a web doc, so to speak, and not a conventional film. Uh, but as things developed and really as we uh, started taking a broader look at, at not just Godfrey's incidents, but other incidents as well, uh, it became clear that, a, you know, that a, both a TV and a feature doc conventional film would be uh, the way to to tell the story, at least uh, so far. But yeah, that uh, that uh, that injustice, it just, you know, in the words of, uh, you know, we did the families of the victims in the film in several different ways, you know, and Pat Heffernan at the end of the film says, you know, injustice is a terrible thing. And I do think there's an insidiousness about it that, uh, that gets under your skin. Uh, what were the challenges making the documentary? Yeah, there were so many sort of challenges along the way. A big part of it was how do we limit what we include here? There are so many facets to this topic and there were so many stories coming out of the Calgary Police Service and everyone we talked to had so much more to say than we could possibly include. And so on, on the editing side, this was a really gargantuan effort to try to compress everything with clarity uh, in, in the initial 44 minute film for uh, CBC that called Above the Law that was broadcast in, in July. 2020, that was a really big challenge for us. Um, and, and what we really wanted to do was make, a, was make something much longer, which is what we ended up doing. They didn't have space for that at CBC to broadcast, but a, a huge part of that, the effort was, was how do we actually focus with clarity on the important parts of this? Because there are so many facets to it. And so many of the important things uh, ultimately have been left out and are impossible to really cover in a documentary film, which is why conversations like this one are important because they allow you to have the detail and the sort of specificity around policy or other issues like that, that just don't make for great documentary film. So trying to focus on the things that we could do in the film while cutting out what ended up being extraneous uh, was a real challenge. I mean, we struggled to get, and maybe Mark can talk more about this, access is just something that we continue to struggle with. And I think that's part and parcel of when you're dealing with a government body and various government bodies, the kind of knee jerk to obstruct is, is very hard to fight. And that's something that we continue to, uh, to fight against even going forward. Mark? It's been... Uh... An interesting journey. I mean, at this point in time, we must be, Lost Time Media must be one of the most prolific uh, freedom of information uh, requesters, both from the Calgary Police Service and the, uh, and the province. I, I bet there's a board somewhere in there with a dartboard, you know, with uh, our photos on it. Yeah, trying to get access to information through different means, the courts, through freedom of information requests, 
uh, is in and of itself its own kind of uh, obsession. We have a number of files right now that have wended their way through the uh, privacy commissioner who uh, 